Today we're going to be learning Tubo Daf Tet, another very, very interesting daf. Um, we're really touching upon now one of the basic issues that we're going to deal with a lot. And I, I kind of promised this when we were in Ketubo, uh, Yavam, but I made mention of this a bunch of times, where we're getting to issues that really grapple with who do we believe, how do we believe them, to what extent do we believe them, for what, all sorts of questions about um, someone's, whether we rely on testimony in certain cases, right, kind of connected with the end of Yavam mode about who we believe about whether someone's dead and can get, whether the woman can get remarried. Likewise, we're gonna have a lot of questions here about who we believe about what. Today's stuff is sponsored by Dr. Robin Zeiger in loving memory of her mother, Helen Zeiger's Yurit site and the first wedding anniversary of her son, Akiva to Rivka. Mom's love and support enabled me to become religious and begin my Jewish learning at ICJA. Today's stuff is also sponsored by Viti Rosenzweig Konis in loving memory of her mother, Sarah Bat David Viviti, who passed away last Friday on the 9th of Tammuz, a righteous woman who survived the Holocaust and went on to build a beautiful family. He is a Okay, we're going to now start at the very bottom of Chet Amudbet, the last three words. Amal Rabbi Elazar. The structure of our daf, it's actually not a very long daf, and the structure is very clear. We start off with the statement of Rabbi Elazar about someone who claims a particular claim and what the reach of that claim will be. We believe it for a particular way, in a particular manner to create, we'll see in a minute. And then we're gonna see Rabbi Yehuda says in the name of Shmuel, that same claim can actually go even farther, okay? So, and then we're gonna deal with each of their statements. We're gonna compare it to Tanaitic statements. Both of them are gonna say, well, doesn't the Mishnah already mean this? And then we're gonna say, no, not really. And we're gonna have some you know, back and forths about it, et cetera. So Rabbi Lazar says, Haomer petach patuach matzati, ne'eman osralat. If a man says, when I had relations with her for the first time, it was clear to me, okay, that it was open there, okay? The area was already wider than it was meant to be. Already before we even go on to the second part of this line, we have a lot, a lot of questions. Okay, first of all, until now, when we talk about Tana Petuli, what did we assume? We assumed that he meant there was no blood, okay? Now we start talking about a different type of claim. And the Gemara today is gonna to deal with what's the difference between ta'anat amim, there was no blood when we have relations the first time, and petach patuach matzati, which is a better claim, okay? But before we even get there though, what does this mean petach patuach matzati? How does he know? Tomorrow we're gonna to see that someone got lashes for making this claim because the rabbi said, how on earth do you know if it was not that you slept around with prostitutes, right? Because how would you know? We're assuming, okay, even though it doesn't really say this, but the assumption is just like, she is an unmarried woman, you know, she's a Betula virgin. He also was not yet married. Could be, maybe it's someone who was married and therefore knows what it should feel like if she was a virgin or not. So anyway, it's a very interesting claim that he claims, and it's what the other issue with this is, it's just based on what he says. Right, so we have number one, right? How does he know? Number two, no one can claim against this. This is like, again, this is quite different, but I remember being in a restaurant once and we asked them to close the, the window or whatever, I don't even remember the details, but it, you know, we said, it's cold in here. And the waiter said, it's not cold in here, right? And, and we had this whole argument, you know, what do you mean it's not cold in here, right? That was his, he wasn't cold, we were cold, right? Same thing here. He claims it was Petach Patuach, right? What could she claim against it, right? She, I can't say what you felt, what you didn't feel, right? Whereas Tanat Amin, you can go against it because Tanat Amin, you say, here, here's the sheet we slept on. There's no blood on it. She could say, here's the sheet we slept on. There is blood on it. So, you know, and then the question is, who's bringing the actual sheet? You know, we'll talk about later when we get Tanat Amin, you know, how they figure out. Um, but there, it's a claim that can be refuted. A claim that can be refuted is always stronger because if it's not refuted, she doesn't come and say, here's the blood, right? Here's the sheet with the blood, then he has a better claim. Petah she doesn't have a way to refute the claim, okay? And it's not a very clear cut claim because it's based on what he senses, not really based on any clear truth. So there's a lot of issues with this Petah Patuach claim. But in any case, to, despite the fact that it's not a perfect claim, and then by the way, we didn't get into this, but there's a whole thing about, um, we'll get to this much later, 
Okay, Tosfa quotes it here on our page. If you look where at the fifth line in Tosfa, it says, Lakaman Lamivav, so that means later on in Daf Lamivav, Bogeret Ein Latana Petulim. Once you get to a certain age, you can't even use Tana Petulim anymore. Be and then it becomes a question what's the issue there? Which we have two Tana Petulim. One is blood, there was no blood, and one is that it was already, you know, there was, it was open. Katach Petuach. So now we get to this issue of which one goes away as she gets older. Is there less likelihood that she'll bleed or does the area already kind of widen enough naturally without? So then get to a whole issue. There's a debate among the commentaries, which Tatna Petulim is no longer when she's older. And then now that we've split it into two, right? Maybe one still is and one still isn't. And there's a debate about it because again, it wasn't so clear to them. You know, right? And first of all, we all know, when I'm thinking of this book, that maybe you know, right? There was with this book everyone gave me when I was pregnant, what to expect when you're expecting. And what you learn in that book is basically you can expect anything and everything. And what might happen to one person, the exact opposite happens to somebody else. And it's the same thing here, right? One woman might this, one woman might that. It's, but we all know that humans are each created very differently. And what happens is not all always exactly the same. So while the sugiya makes it sound like it's very black and white. There's either petach patuach or there it's closed. And there's blood or there wasn't blood. But you start to see later that, well, Bulgarian already, you can't really make these claims. And then which ones we don't really know. But so on the one hand, the studio seem very clear cut. On the other hand, it's clear. And today's studio is going to make it clear that we're not exactly sure how to treat this claim of petach patuach. So the first statement we have about petach patuach is, if he says, Petach Petuach Matati, he's Ne'eman Le'osra Allah. That means, if you remember, let's go back to the Mishnah. The Mishnah had said, you have to get married on Wednesday. Why? So that you could go the next morning to claim that Tana Petuli and the courts are open. And then we discussed that it wasn't clear what he's going to the court to claim. Is it a monetary issue that he wants to say, I gave you a tube of 200 zoos, I want to drop it to 100 because you weren't a virgin? Or is he saying, I'm concerned that you have relations after we were engaged, ready? Once we were betrothed. And if you did, well, then we can't be together anymore, right? It's forbidden. Because remember, again, there's stage one, she's not married to anybody. Theoretically, she could be with anybody, right? She's not allowed to have premarital sex, but if she did, it doesn't mess her up in any way. Again, mess her up that she's not a betula anymore and then financially. But from the moment they get engaged, which again, is not what we do nowadays, but halachic engagement, which is birchada erusim, that we do under the chuppah, that they did a year before, usually, from that moment, she now can't be with anybody, even her husband. If she ends up with somebody else, she's already betrothed to them. Remember, she already needs to get from there, from the guy at that point, if, forget about it, if she was with someone else. If he doesn't want to marry her at that point, he has to give her a, a divorce document. That means they're basically married. Now, halachically, right, they're not fully married to the extent that they can live together but they are married. So that means, right, they're betrothed, that means that if she's with someone else during that time, she's in Eshet Isha already. That means that she can't stay married to her husband. So this statement of Rabbi Elazal says that if he claims Petach Patuach Matzati, he's believed not for the Ketubah, okay, because she could be right, but he's believed to forbid her to him. Okay, that means she can no longer stay married. Now, why is this? Why is he believed specifically there and not in the other? So for this, again, we're going to look at Rashi. Oh, first of all, I forgot to read the first Rashi. First Rashi is very important. One other point I wanted to mention before we go on to this is that here, I'll just read it inside. The question is, okay, let's assume the Ta'anat Damim is a better claim. We're going to see this later in the Gemara. Because again, as I said before, you can refute the claim, right? And you have something physical to show for it. He brings a sheet. He says, look, this is the sheet we slept on. There's no blood on it. So why is he saying, Matati? why isn't he claiming, look, there was no blood? So Rashi has to explain that. So Rashi explains, this would have to be a case where he doesn't have a Ta'anat Damim, not because there was blood, because otherwise his claim would be no good. We're going to see that tomorrow. They don't have dam betulim at all. Okay, they also don't have dam nida. It's a strange family. We'll see what that is tomorrow. He lost the sheet and he forgot to check it. Okay, so he doesn't have 
the evidence. It would have to be a case according to Rashi, okay? Im zot right? Aval zot lo patuach matzah. So he doesn't have any proof from the blood for whatever reason. Therefore, option B, option two is to say, okay, but I do know that what I felt was that it was a wide opening, which it shouldn't have been. So now, why is he ne'eman oschala? She now becomes forbidden to him. Okay, he can't sleep with her anymore. He has to divorce her, basically. So Rashi says, Afapi, it's just his word, which we don't know whether to believe it or not. This is a very famous principle, which is called I can make something forbidden to myself. Okay, I can go to court and say something which would basically forbid it to me, not to somebody else, but to myself. So now, Rashi says that when Rabbi Elazar says he's believed to forbid her to him, that's just because he's basically being strict with himself. That's permitted, that you can do, because it doesn't affect, now it's interesting, it doesn't, you say it doesn't affect anyone else, in this case it affects her as well. But basically it's saying, I am forbidden to her. Soon we'll get to a case where he forbids himself something that she's not forbidden, we'll see that soon. But not to make her lose her ketubah, because that's something that only affects her, and it's actually good for him, right? So we don't believe him for that. Okay, we'll see someone who does believe him for that, but not Rabbi Elazar. So now I want to just talk for a minute off the daf about what the principle of Shavi Anafsha is based upon. So there's two, there might be more, but there's two basic ways of looking at this. One is to say, we say, Hoda'at baldin edim dam. That means, Hoda'at baldin is a confession. If I come and confess, that's like 100 witnesses came. So if he's coming and confessing to something that affects him negatively, then he can go and confess. So great. That's one option. Another possibility is a very interesting one, and I wanted to bring it up here. Soon we're going to get to Masechet Nidarim. Okay, that's our next Masechet. What happens in Masechet in a neder? A neder is a vow. I, and we talked about this already, that the rabbis didn't like people vowing. One of the reasons they didn't like people taking vows was because there's enough things forbidden to us in the Torah. We don't need to forbid more things to us. Because basically what a neder is, is it's saying something that's permitted to me is now going to be forbidden, right? I don't want to ever drink wine. So I'm, not, I'm going to take a vow. I will not drink wine. So shavia anafsha, according to some people, works midin neder. It's basically as if the person saying, I know that legally, halakhically, my wife is permitted to me. But I'm going to forbid her to me, okay? Or, or again, Shavia could be in any, could be all different kind of situations. I'm using the example in our situation, where he's basically saying, I know that if I didn't say anything, she'd be permitted and we could live together with no problem. But I am basically creating, a, I'm basically taking a vow that because I'm concerned of something, right? I'm going to forbid this upon me. And then it's very different whether you say it's from a vow or it's Hoda Baldi. Hoda Baldi basically makes it sound like we believe you, you're believed, and therefore, right, this is the truth, and therefore, it's actually a soul. If it's midinede, it's different. It's like a voluntary thing, and we're voluntarily allowing you to forbid yourself. Just, but it's not really right. If you vow something's forbidden to you, it's not really isur. I mean, yes, you have to keep your nede. But it's it's of a different nature, so it's just interesting conceptually. I don't know what the practical ramifications would be, but I thought it was interesting conceptually and wanted to bring it up. And it's a short daf, so we have a little time. Okay, going back to our daf, am I? So now the Gemara says, wait a minute, we have some issues here with this state. It's a fake sfekahu. This is a sefek upon another sefek. That means there's two doubts here. Whenever there's two doubts, we don't go for this, right? We don't forbid things that are two doubts. So what's the issue here? Safek tachtav, safek ain't tachtav. What do we say? So number one, right? Why would she be forbidden? Only if she's not a virgin because she had relations during the betrothal time period. But if it was before, right? We have no idea when this woman had relations with someone. We'd have no evidence she even had relations. The only thing is his worried claiming that I found a petach patuach, but shouldn't necessarily be forbidden to him because maybe she had relations before they were betrothed. And intim saloma tachtav, even if it was when she was betrothed, there's still two possibilities within that. Safek ba'onis, safek ba'ratzon. Maybe she was raped by someone, right? We don't know if she was raped or did it willingly. Now, if you're raped, then you can go back to your husband, unless what? 
unless you're married to a Kohen. We've talked about that in Yavama. It's a very difficult situation where a woman is married to a Kohen, is raped, can't go back to her husband. Okay, very tough halacha. So basically, this is what we call a sfeik sfeika, two gals. Maybe she was married to him, maybe she wasn't. Maybe she was, uh, sorry, maybe she was already betrothed to him when it happened, maybe she wasn't. Maybe it was rape, maybe it was not rape. So if we have two doubts, she shouldn't be forbidden to him, even based on his own testimony, because based on his own testimony, we still have a sfeik sfeika. To which the Gemara answers, we're now going to limit the scope of what Rabbi Elazar said. When he said this, either he was talking about Lotzricha, Be'eshet Kohen, he was talking about the wife of a Kohen, where there's only a doubt what, right, she's, we could just, even if she's raped, it didn't matter. She would be forbidden. But so there's one safek. Was she, was she either raped or willingly, right? Doesn't matter before the betrothal or during the betrothal. At that point, one safek will be stringent. Israel, or even if it was an Eish Israel, another case, Kegon de Kabilba. Okay, be prepared for this one. Kabilba Avua Kidushim Chutami Bat Shalosh Shanim Beyom Echad. She was betrothed before she was at the age of three. We learned already in Yavamot, from the age of three, again, hard to, hard to swallow this halacha, from the age of three, a woman is already considered potentially able to have sexual relations. Anything before that doesn't really count. So we're assuming, let's say, someone tried to have relations with her before she was three, it wouldn't tear her hymen like it would close up again or something like that. So the case here would be there's no suffix, was she betrothed to her or not, because a father betrothed the daughter, which by the way, it could have happened in those days, right? It's often at a young age, right? Kids born, they say, oh, let's betroth my son to your daughter. And, you know, perfect. So basically in those days, right? That's what the fathers did. They wanted to make sure their daughters were cared for. They worried about them even at a young age and they betrothed them at a very young age. So theoretically, this could be only in a case where she was betrothed in the age of three, which meant basically once, um, once, there's, she must have lost her petulium over the age of three. Okay, I see that, one second. I see that, Marsha, you're writing, it's not true that a girl is raped as a child that would lose her hymen. So definitely, um, right, it's very likely that the rabbis had a perception of what it would be, right? And they're going based on their perception, even if it doesn't necessarily match reality. So now the Gemara says, uh, another question. So that was our first question. We now resolved it by narrowing the focus of the statement. It's not really any case because most cases would be a sphinx fake. Now, okay, let's put that aside right now. Now we're just going back to his basic statement and the idea that Petach Patuach Mansati is Neaman Oschala. My Kamashmanan, Tanina, what do you need, Rabbi Lazar, who's an Amora, by the way, an Amora from Israel, what do you need him to tell you this if it's already an explicit Mishnah? Now, what's an explicit Mishnah? Not exactly our case. But a case that's very similar, where again, we employ the principle of one can create an isur upon oneself. Tanina says in a Mishnah, okay, he says to a woman, I betrothed you. Actually, I'm not sure if it's a bright or a Mishnah, but either way. He says to a woman, I betrothed you. Thank you, it's a Mishnah. Okay. Um, and he, she says, you did not betroth me, okay? So she claims, I was not betrothed by this man. He claims, I betrothed this woman. Now, do you remember what we learned? If you're betrothed to someone, then you're never allowed to marry her sister, right? Unless the woman dies. You're not allowed to marry, right? All sorts of relatives of hers. So he Because he says, I betrothed her. He forbids himself right away to all her relatives. But since she claims you did not betroth me, she's not forbidden to any of his relatives. So she can marry his brother if she wants, but he can't marry her sister. Okay, here you see the law of Shavi and Lanafsha. Because his testimony forbade him to her relatives, because by saying I betrothed her, that already has ramifications to her relatives. But she didn't, so, right, it's a funny thing where we basically say we believe him about her, even though it only affects her, right? Whereas it affects her, it doesn't affect her in the sense that she can marry his relatives. So why do we need Rabbi Lazar to tell us that if he says, it's the same thing as that? To which the Gemara is going to say, well, it's not exactly the same. Thing. If you just had the mission, you might have thought it wouldn't apply to our case. Why? You might have thought, and again, we're going to get to the nature. What's good about these questions they're asking is you get to the nature of what this claim of Petach Patuach is. 
So he said, which again, to us is a very strange claim. Like, how does he know and on what basis and all that? When he claims I betrothed her, what he's saying is, I went through this action. It's clear to him now. Obviously, somebody's lying, but he's making a clear claim. I did a betrothal. I took a ring. I gave it to her. I said, I am a Kudesh Ali. And she basically says, I don't know what you're talking about. That never happened. But he's making what we call a bari claim, a clear claim. His claims you can make that are stuff, right? Uh, and not a clear claim. His claims you can make that are clear. This is a clear claim. Aval hacha may come who delo kimle. But here, okay, so Rashi says, if you look at aval hacha, it's a bunch of lines lower down in Rashi. Ema mitoksha panoi hayave inova ki, because we're assuming he was not married and not an expert on the anatomy of a woman and what it would feel like going into a woman's body who is either a virgin or not a virgin. It's not something that's definitively clear to him. You might have thought, no, you might have thought, and I, we definitely would have thought this, I would say, right? That he can't necessarily know what he's finding there. And maybe therefore we don't believe him to forbid himself to her. But Kamash Maman comes to the Lazar says, no, we do believe him. This is a claim that would work. Okay, again, it only works according to him. Only to forbid himself, which also has ramifications for the woman because she now gets left on the street. But what we're really focusing on is that he becomes forbidden to her. So even though we had the other mission, the other mission won't be, won't give us clarity on this issue because the other mission is a clear claim. And this is not a fully clear claim. It's because it's not a clear claim. You might've thought we don't accept it. It uh, comes Rabbi Lazar to say we do. Remember, the whole question wasn't that we don't think it's true what Rabbi Lazar said. We just think, why would he say it if there's an omission that says the same thing? And the answer is, well, he's adding to the Mishnah because the Mishnah is talking about a different case. Now we have another question on Rabbi Lazar. So we have one question on Rabbi Lazar, isn't it a fake sveka? We answered that by narrowing the focus of the statement. Then we said, doesn't the Mishnah say it? And then we distinguish between the Mishnah and his, his case. Now we're going to say, but doesn't Rabbi Lazar say something contradictory entirely? And you're going to be surprised by this based on some things we learned in Yuvama, but don't worry, we're going to explain it a little bit differently than the simple reading. But first, we'll explain it according to the simple reading. Let's just go back for a minute to basic laws. What did we learn in Yuvama? If a woman, and this is why, if a woman sleeps with another man while she's married to Man A, she sleeps with man B, she becomes forbidden both la ba'al, both to man A, and la bo'el, and to man B. And there was a lot of this at the end of Yavama when we talked about claiming that her husband's dead, and then it turns out he was alive, and she ended up, while he was still alive, sleeping with somebody else, right, marrying somebody else, she becomes forbidden to both husband A and husband B, right, depending on the scenario. There were all different details. Anyone who missed it, next cycle, you'll get to it. Okay, it was seven and a half years. So now, the Gemara says, doesn't Rabbi Elazar say, in this case of her having slept with another man, she doesn't become forbidden to her first husband unless, or her husband basically, unless ela aliske kinoi v'stira u'chemasha shahaya. Okay, first let's explain part one, kinoi and stira, and then we'll explain kemasha shahaya. Kinoi v'stira is are words used by the sota. What's the case of a sota woman? It's a woman whose husband suspects her of being with another man, he warns her. First, he's jealous of her. That's Kinoi. And he says to her, listen, don't go be alone in a man in a room with that man. I think something's going on between you. Then she goes into a room alone with that man. That's stira, like hidden. She goes into a room with him, and there's witnesses that see her going into the room. So that's Kinoi and stira. So now Rabbi Lazar said in a different place or a different time that the only time a woman's forbidden to go back to her husband is when it has the Sota model to it is not like what we saw in Yavama, okay? So hold off on that. It's where you have to have that the husband was jealous of the woman with this man. He warned her. She went into a room alone with him and there was, we'll see in a minute, there's even just one witness, but there was a witness that saw her go into the room alone with him. That's when we forbid her now to go back to her original husband. What's that? And like is what happened with David and Bathsheba. Okay, remember David? Goes with, right, takes Bacheva. She was married to Uyachiti. He was out at war. So we'll get back to this in a minute. The Gemara says now, wait a minute. No one ever talked about it. Uriah said to her, 
I'm jealous. I see you with David, you know, and, and don't go in a room alone with him. And then she did. That's not what happened. Not certainly not with the with the the Navi tells us, right? In the, in the book of Shmua. So that's number one. And no one ever said she was forbidden to go back to Riachiti. So this whole second, those last two words make absolutely no sense in the context here. So the Gemara says, okay, we'll resolve that before we get to the contradiction between Rabbi Elazar. In other words, what's the contradiction with Rabbi Elazar just we talk about? Rabbi Elazar, oh, maybe we'll just get back to that later. Let's first try to understand this line. Halo kashi, hachi kama. This is what, it, that's not a difficult, this is what it means. Ain Aisha, when Rabbi Elazar made the statement, what he meant was this. Ain Aisha ne'eseret avala ela alis kekinoi v'stira. How do we know this? It was two questions all basically formed the answer. From David and Bathsheba, we learned there was no kinoi, there was no stira, and she wasn't forbidden to go back to her husband. So from there, we learn that only when there's kinoi and stira, she forbidden to go back to her husband. Okay, so from what was missing from that case, we learn when you would be forbidden to your husband. Okay, so then we resolve that. But here we get to the difficulty. But what's the difficulty? It says the only time she'll be forbidden to her husband is if there's kinoi and stira. What does Rabbi Elazar say? She's forbidden to her husband if he claims petach patuach. That's not kinoi v'stira. That's some other thing. That's when he comes and claims it's much weaker than kinoi and stira. Was it that we knew there was a man and he, that he was jealous of and she went into a room alone with him? We don't even know of any man. We don't know of any room. We don't know of anything. All we know is that he claims I found a petach patuach when I, when I have relations with her. That's definitely not what Rabbi Elazar said in the other place. He seemed to be really limiting when we forbid this woman to the man. So how do we resolve this? So the Gemara says, wait a minute. Forget about petach patuach. I have a bigger question on Rabbi Elazar from what we learned in Yuvama. What if there were witnesses that saw that she committed adultery with another man? We wouldn't forbid her to our husband. That's the basic law that we learned at Yavama. A woman who sleeps with somebody else. We never said it had to be that the husband was jealous of her and she went into a room alone and there were witnesses she went into a room alone. What if there were witnesses that she had relations with some other man without kinoi? That, right? Let's say right, that would that would clearly be a problem. Okay. Any woman, let's say well, we saw this. The man went off, they thought he was dead. She went and slept with someone else. Forget about that. That wasn't even. She wasn't even intending to cheat on him. And yet she's forbidden to go back to her original husband, right? So if there's witnesses that see that she was with some other man, then clearly, right, she'd be forbidden. So to which the Gemara says, okay, fine. This is what Rabbi Elazar meant. He wasn't saying exclusively, this is the only case. What he, he basically has, we're going to talk about three tracks. Three tracks that can get a woman to be forbidden to her husband. Track number one, Okay, if a woman was seen to be committing adultery by one witness, that wouldn't be enough. You need two witnesses. Okay, but once you have two witnesses, that's track number one. Two witnesses saw she had relations with another man while she was married. She was while she was married to man A. She's with man B. Forbidden to go back to man A, and obviously also to man B. But that's not our question. Number two, this is what I told you before. Once the husband suspects her and warns her, do not go into a room alone with this man. And then only one witness sees her going to the room. Since we call this as raglayim ledaval, there's already reason to believe that there's something wrong going on here. We're going to accept one witness to forbid her to go back to her original husband. So that's option two, where you only need one witness, but it's kinoi v'stira. Okay, so kinoi v'stira and one witness, that's enough to forbid her as well. So if there's no kinoi v'stira, you need two witnesses. Kinoi v'stira, one witness is enough. Third track, upetach patuach, and here you're going to find this surprising in light of the, what we talked about already about this claim of petach patuach, kishne edim dami. It has the strength of shne edim. Now it's not really shne edim. Why is it not shne edim? Because it's not shne edim because we already said it's not the most clear claim. But again, to forbid her to him, we can say it's treated like two witnesses. His claim is enough to forbid it as if there were two witnesses. Um, 
Yeah, I didn't talk about this. I see you writing in the chat about it, but you can look at Rashi if you want. By um, by the Sota, how do they know one witness? Because it says the aid Enba. Okay, there's a thing that says the aid Enba because it seems to indicate aid singular. Okay, there's a whole thing about it. Okay, the Chi Tema. Now we have another question. The Chi. So now we basically resolve. So we had a question. Rabbi our seems to contradict himself. Ah, there's three tracks. One is our statement, Petach Petuach. One is the Kinoi Vestira. And then there's a third one, which we discussed previously in Yavamo, you know, where that's two ways. That one, not as important for our purposes, but you may as well just say it since we're spelling it all out. Now the Gemara says, Now we have a side question about Tavini Batshev. Why wasn't she forbidden to go back to her original husband? Okay. So we're going to have two possible answers. Hatam Ones Hava. Maybe she was raped and you could consider it rape, even if maybe she was willing, we don't know really. But even if she was, you could say, if the king wants to sleep with you, you're basically, it's like rape. You don't really have a choice in the matter. So you could say that, and this is very famous and just pay attention that this is really just an answer given to a question. And there's two possibilities of the answer here. As Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani says in the name of Rabbi Yonatan, Anyone who went out to war in the time of David wrote a get to his wife. So she wasn't actually married to Uyachiti. This is what people also say to justify David's actions. Say it wasn't really that he was sleeping with a married woman. She had a divorce document from Uyachiti. How do we know this? Because when Yishai sent David to see his brothers in war when they were fighting against the Plushim with Goliath, and David eventually kills Goliath in that scene. He's told by his father, go see how your brothers are doing. But remember, he wasn't there originally and he was just bringing them some food. What is the word? It's a word that doesn't, it's not a very common word. What does it mean? It says, it's bring them things that have to do with him and her. Basically, bring them a get to sign so that they would give their wives get so that they're, if something happened in war, right? So therefore, we assume that she must have had this, okay? Now, this is something, okay, very, um, this was used, by the way. It's called a get altna, yes, as, you, as I see you writing. It's a get altna that if something happens, this will be your divorce document. Um, here, it sounds like it wasn't a get altna, okay? This sounds like, Right, Rashi says here, get kritucha im yamut b'melchama yehi get miyom ktivato. Pa'remet Uriah b'melchama. In other words, how did it work here? Because Uriah eventually did die in war, which means that when he dies in war, retroactively, this will be your get from now. That's how the get works. Okay, so first of all, this method was suggested to be employed at a certain point in history. Okay, so um, if you you can just look at Wikipedia and get al it's I uh, yeah get al tnai. So I'm looking from there. Um, in the Second World War, the Rabbanud in Israel sent Jewish soldiers to the to fight, and they had the Rabbi Tzvi Rashi of the of the British, Professor Levi Yitzchak Rabinovich, on Shvi Shal Pesach of Tavshin Gimel, sent a telegram. He, I'm sorry, he received a telegram on Shvi Shal Pesach for the Rabbi Rashi in Israel, Yitzchak Isaac Levi Herzog, where he said about this pluga that was going and. Uh, and they hadn't yet given their, their soldiers an option to do a get out tonight. And he basically, what they did was he got all the chayalim team, the religious soldiers, and they all signed a get out tonight. Okay, that next morning, uh, at that morning, it sounds like. I don't know. I, I don't know all the details. Anyway, that's that. Then there was a suggestion to do this in the army also. Okay, Rav Goren was very against it. And he said, number one, it's kind of like a, for, a get that's being forced because he doesn't really want to give the get. But the real issue, he said, was that it was going to cause soldiers to be nervous about dying. It would, it would ruin their morale. And that was more important that they go in with a good, positive you know, morale and not feel like they had just divorced their wives. You know? So basically, the, he really discouraged doing this. And that's why we don't really do this nowadays. Although somebody told me that there is a tofes in the army that exists, that you can do this if you want, even though they were against it. Apparently the tofus exists, like there's a form that one could sign uh, when going into war. Okay. Um, Af Ananami Tania. So now we have another question. So that was a side question, what we saw before. This is a side question about why wasn't she forbidden to go back? 
Okay, but if we look at our structure, it's a very clear structure. We started with the statement of Rabbi Elazar. First, we asked, isn't it a spake spake? We resolved that by narrowing the focus of what he said. Then we brought a Mishnah and said, isn't it clear from the Mishnah? And then they said, no, it's not clear from the Mishnah because that Mishnah was talking about a, a case where he was clear about his claim. This is a little bit of a less clear claim. Then we brought contradiction of Rabbi Elazar himself because he said only with Kinoin Sirash he forbidden and here with Petr Petua. And then we said, well, there's really three tracks that could forbid you to your husband. Then we had a side question about David Bathsheba because that came up in the context of that. And now, last question on this section is, Am Rabbi Af Ana Nami Tanina. It's not really a question. It's just, he's saying, we also can find support for what he's saying in a Mishnah, or maybe you could say, it's already said in a Mishnah and there's no reason for him to say this. It's not clear if it's coming as a question or as just pointing out that you can find the same thing in the Mishnah. With, from our Mishnah, look at our Mishnah. Our Mishnah says, Bitulani say the Yom Rivi'i. Yeah. Tulani say what day? On Wednesday. Why Wednesday? Liom Rivi in Liom Chamishilo. Sounds like only Wednesday, not Thursday. What's the problem with Thursday? My time. We're worried that he'll, for, he'll decide by, sun, by Monday when the courts open. Ah, I won't make a big deal of this. Now, the question is Lamai, why is he coming to court? And we mentioned this when we first read the Mishnah. There's two potential issues here. Either he's coming to court to say, lower the ketuba money, right? It's too much money. Or, right, she's not a betula, she's not a virgin. Or he's coming to say, I suspect that she was with someone while we were engaged and therefore I have to divorce her, I can't be with her. So, Elon may tell, now, the other detail we have is, we're worried that he'll be appeased by the time it's, right, he won't be so angry anymore and he just won't bother coming to court. If the issue is lowering the tuba amount, and he just decides, you know what, I just won't bother. I'm thinking it's a very different case, but you know, sometimes you buy something in the store and then you decide you don't want it anymore, but you're too lazy to go return it, right? It's too much of a pain. Okay, it wasn't that expensive. I'll just keep it. So it could be that he's going to say, it's again, very different, but I'm just using it as an example. It could be he's going to say, whatever, I promised her 200, I'll just leave it. It's too much of a pain to go to court and start changing it and claiming and what, do I want to hang out my dirty laundry in public, you know, and start doing this? That I think is a bigger reason not to do it. Anyway, so if that, if it's Lameta Black Tuba, why would the rabbi say, we don't want you to, the career de ato that he'll calm down. We want to make sure he actually goes to court and claims it. Why would the, why would the rabbis care? Native law, so he'll give her more money. It's up to him whether he wants to give her 200 zoos or 100 zoos. That's his issue. The rabbis would, don't really care. It doesn't affect them in any way. I, I, can, I can always give someone a gift if I want. So if the man wants to give her a gift of an extra 100 zoos that she's not deserving of, let him do it. So if it's that we're worried that he'll calm down about it, it's obviously because there's some isur involved. So the first point they make is clearly the Mishnah must be talking about le'osrala. Okay, the, the issue here, we're worried about the betuling, is that she might have had relations with someone while she was betrothed to him. And then, now, he comes forward with a claim. Now, he didn't say what his claim is in the mission. My love, is it not dikatayin tana petach patuach? And then what do you see here? The mission is basically saying, if he said petach patuach matati, and we don't want him to calm down about it because he's actually forbidden to her, then the mission is already telling you that when he comes forward and says petach patuach matati, then she's forbidden to him. That's exactly what Rabbi Lazar said. So what Rabbi Lazar said, is saying is really in our mission. To which the Gemara says, lo, tikatayin ta'anat damin. Now there's two possible claims he can make. We already said this. The Mishnah was referring to, if he comes forward and says, here's the sheet, there's no blood, okay? That is when we say she'll be forbidden. Rabbi Lazar is adding, right, she'll be forbidden to him. What, what Rabbi Lazar is adding is, even in Tana Petach Petuach, which again, this proves that Tana Petach Petuach is a weaker claim. Even Tana Petach Petuach will be enough Right? he can forbid her to him by making that claim in court. And that wasn't clear from the Mishnah, even though Abaye thought it was, Gemara says it wasn't. Now we get to the next statement about Petach Patuach. And this mostly will be dealt with tomorrow. We'll only have one question on it today that we will resolve. Amarav Yehud Amar He takes, what Rabbi Lazar says, he takes it a step farther. Okay, not clear that he was working off Rabbi Lazar, but he, clearly he takes this farther. It's not just midin. Here, he can really forbid her to demand her, right, to, to demand the 200 zoos. 
he can lower the amount of the ketubah, which means it doesn't only affect him, his claim petach patuach can affect her as well. Meaning we accept it as a valid claim and we believe him. Tomorrow we're going to have to say, why do we believe him? Like we have to have, when it's that he's just forbidding something to himself, he's believed either because of Hoda Abaldin, Kimei Dami, as we said in the beginning, that's a confession. Or, and again, as it only affects him, it's fine. Or because he's, it's like he's taking a nedar upon himself. It's like he's forbidding something that maybe potentially is permitted, but it's going to forbid it. But you can't say that here. Here it's affecting somebody else that it's making her lose money. And it's actually in his benefit. So on what basis are we believing him? That you'll have to wait till the next shiwa. But right now we're going to have another question. Amor of Yosef, the same type of question we had before. My Kamashvalan, Tanina. This already appears in the Mishnah. Okay, it says in the Mishnah, Ha'ochel etzel chamiv b'yehuda. Okay, this is going to be on daf yudbet. If one eats in his father-in-law's house in Yudah, the couple is engaged. Normally, during the engagement, he stayed in his house, she stayed in her house, they weren't living together. But if he eats by his father-in-law's house, I meaning he goes to the house where she is, in Yehuda, if you remember, <clears throat> we said in Yehuda that they often did Yehud. They were alone in a room together, often during the engagement time period, because they wanted them to get to know each other better. So they didn't like this idea, okay, we live totally separately, we have this betrothal, and then boom, one day you're married. No, you have to build a relationship. So if he was eating by his father-in-law's house in Yehuda, Shalom Be'edin, and he wasn't with Edin, meaning he went to a room alone with her. It's not just that he was eating there, but he ended up in a room alone with her. There were no witnesses that could testify to what happened between them. He can no longer make a tana betuling. Why? Because we're suspicious that maybe he already had relations with her. Because he was alone in a room with her. So, you know, we'll assume chances are it was with her. It was with him. So what does this show, though? Specifically in Yehuda, because they would do Yichud, there he can't claim tana betuling. Ha begalil matzitain. But for Galil, it sounds like he could claim Tana Petulim. So now the question becomes Limai. For what is he claiming Tana Petulim? Again, we have these two options. Ilos Chalav, if it's to forbid him, hurt to him, be Yehuda Amailo. Even if they were alone in a room and there's suspicion that maybe something happened in Yehuda, but he comes along and says, listen, it wasn't me and she is not a virgin, then we should believe him because that's the din of Shavi Nafshachat Yichad Yisura. He's believed because he can forbid himself, even if it, the evidence doesn't support him. He wants to forbid himself. He can do that. So it's obviously not talking about Los Chalav because then it would be forbidden from Yehuda as well. We have to find a case where only in the Galil it would be forbidden, but not there. So El Alav Lafsidak Tubatan must be that the subject of that mission is that she loses her Ketuba money. He's believed because they were alone in a room together and therefore, and that's in Yehuda, yes, in the Galil, since they weren't in the room to lo- alone together, we're going to assume there was somebody else. And she actually loses her ketuba money based on that. So now we're going to see, uh, what was his claim? My love, we can assume it must be he came and said, matzati, and then he'll be believed. Again, as long as they weren't alone in a room together during the period of the engagement, like in Yehuda. So there you have it already says it in the Mishnah. So why are you telling us this? Shmuel. To which the Gemara answers, lo, to katayin ta'anat amim. You could just very simply say, it was ta'anat amim and not ta'anat petach patuah. Because again, we said, ta'anat amim is a much stronger claim. If he comes and brings the sheet and says, look, no blood on the sheet, and she doesn't claim otherwise, then we believe him and she loses her ketubah money. Okay? In a case where they weren't in a room alone together. That's not the same as petach patuah. Petach patuah comes Shmuel and he says, I believe Petach Patuach is like Tanat Amit. The Mishnah talked only about Tanat Amit, okay? But I think even Petach Patuach. So he's, been, again, this is basically the same thing as Rabbi Lazar, except he's, it's not at all the same thing because he's taking it one step farther and he's saying, right, not only Tanat Amit can make you lose your tuba money, but even Tanat Petach Patuach. Rabbi Lazar had said, Tanat Amit and Petach Patuach can make you, make her forbidden to you. But that's because Din Shavin Lenafsha. Here we're saying we actually believe you and she can lose her ketuba money. So the real big question, which we'll deal with the first to give to, of the next stop, is really on what basis is he believed? Because he's basically testifying about himself to have himself gain money, basically, and not have to promise her so much money in the ketuba. There has to be something else that's giving him ne'emanut, as we call it, that we believe him. Okay, And this is, again, as I said, it's going to be a topic 
or maybe I didn't say this, but it's going to be a topic that we're going to see a lot over the next while, which is all about, and I mentioned this at the end of Yavama, all about Nehemanu. It connects with the end of Yavama. Who we believe, what kind of witnesses, what kind of reason would they have to lie or not to lie? Chazaka, what kind of, do they have something going in their favor? So this is what we're going to get at uh, over the course of the next while of all sorts of cases of believing witnesses in particular situations. With that, we will end today and wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom.